but since the non-feedback or non what he termed the non-feedback or non-teleological, which is one of the first, it's either the first or second distinction that he draws, he essentially it turns into a binary tree. He doesn't explore that. He notes it and then moves on with the one that he's interested in. I, so I, I should recommend you to the paper because I don't offhand recall all the different, there's at least six different categories that he goes through. So anyway, purpose is okay, and I can explain it. And I can explain it naturally, and I don't have to introduce something vitalistic or mystical or mysterious about it. And certain people were floored because it resonated with their own work. First off, there was Warren McCulloch, who was interested in the nervous system, what it did, and how the nervous system managed to participate in self-regulation, control of behavior, and so on and so forth. There was Gregory Bateson, who Philip is going to tell us much about later this afternoon, and Margaret Mead. McCulloch was the first to get to Frank Fremont Smith. Frank Fremont Smith, at the time, was the person in charge of the Macy Foundation uh, activities re regarding funding and management of conference series. McCulloch immediately told Fremont Smith, we need a meeting on this, like now. This is big. Fremont Smith, who himself had an interest in uh, psychology, psychiatry, and mental health, w had similarly been blown away. And he told McCulloch, right. So by the time, a day or two later, when Bateson and Meade separately contacted Fremont Smith and said, this is big. We need to talk about this. We need a meeting or something. Fremont Smith said, I'm already on the case. And the net effect of Bateson and Meade's contacts were that it was not going to be limited to biological or medical researchers. It was going to be opened up to social scientists as well. The only problem was there was this little thing called World War II, which had just gotten underway. So they'd have to wait essentially another four years until 1946 and... Brandy, yep. 1939 was the beginning of World War II in those other continents. Yes. Thank you. But not here. So... Once the war had passed, the experiment began. And it was something of an experiment. I mean, you know the old phrase, as much fun as a barrel of monkeys? Well, in effect, this was a barrel of scholarly monkeys who were taking a chance not only on discussing a new type of subject matter, but on discussing it in a context where a number of them from very different fields had come together and the entire notion of the event was intended to be cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary, and even transdisciplinary. In particular, Frank Fremont Smith and Lawrence Frank were uh, both had credentials and uh, a lot of credit due them in psychology, social work, social sciences. But they were the ones who worked for the Macy Foundations. They were managers of discussion and communication and research and providing funding. They were enthusiastic about setting it up. In particular, Fremont Smith was interested from the beginning in the idea that this circular causality purposive system kind of thing that Rosenblut had spoken about could serve as the basis of a truly transdisciplinary field that would cut across the divisions and compartments that had separated a lot of them previously. In 46, they started with the core group, which was Fremont Smith, Frank, McCulloch, Mead Bateson, and Rosenblut, carried over from that 42 session. Additional people drawn from a number of other fields including Norbert Wiener and Julian Big Bigelow and others. There would later be other core members, including one Heinz von Forster, who I'll mention later, and about 44 guest attendees in 10 conferences that occurred from 1946 to 1953. Please, before this end of this slide, since we just gave her an award, let me point out um, 
Mary Catherine Bates and in between Margaret yeah. Bates and Gregory Bates and who were married at the time. Yeah. Um, and in that this slide. <laughs> The history itself of the conferences and what they talked about gets very tangled. I want to touch on a couple of general topics, though, that aren't often mentioned and which often contribute to misapprehensions about cybernetics, what it is, what it isn't, where it came from, what its proper subject matter may be. It's often presumed that the Macy Conference attendees were primarily mathematicians like Wiener, or people with particular interests in engineering fields, particularly electrical, electronic fields. That is not true. About 71% of the total participants in the conferences during their 10-year run came from the social sciences, the biological and medical sciences. And of the two top types of topics that would come to be most strongly associated with the Macy participants, particularly mathematics and logic and engineering and physical sciences, those people only represented 17% of the participant population. Well, if they weren't who we thought they were, did they talk about what we thought they talked about? Essentially, no. In terms of talking about uh, information theory and robots, basically nine out of how many was it? 51 presentation units. A presentation unit, this, refer, uh, this is basically one presentation made. Format of the conference was presentation followed by discussion. The majority of the presentations during the 10 years had to do with logical models that could relate to both the brain and computer. Second place went to human and social communication with 11, of which only six had anything to do with human language or natural language at all. The last entry, General Epistemology, is the only presentation that was more or less philosophical in nature. It was by, uh, what's his first name? A psychiatrist named Kuby. Lawrence. Lawrence, right. I always want to call him Lewis for some reason. He touched off a huge debate about something that would become a big deal later. In other words, the observer. To the best of my knowledge, the response that he set off, not his presentation, was one of the few occasions during the Macy conferences where the notion of what we now always talk about as the observer arose. So how did it come to have a name? If it was an amorphous field and there were different people and they were talking about it in different ways, how did it come to have a name? Well, first it was feedback mechanisms and circle, circular causal systems and biological and social systems. Da, 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 da. Then they shortened that somewhat, teleological mechanisms and circular causal systems, and then they went back to mechanisms again. But these same elements appear again and again and again, until the sixth conference, when a new arrival from Austria, one Heinz von Forster, shows up. He's new to the states, he's new to the conferences, but he's very enthusiastic. He's the sort of newbie that the old pros would immediately give the scud work to, and they did. They appointed him as the editor of the proceedings, and they specifically said because he needed to improve his English skills, and this would be a wonderful opportunity. The first thing he did, though, was he said, I'm having a problem with this long title, and there in the meeting he said, I have a proposal. Can't we shorten it to simply call it cybernetics? name it after Wiener's book, which had been published, uh, which was essentially brand new at the time, published the previous year. And so from that point onward, cybernetics became the running title. It wasn't done because of any general consensus. It wasn't done because of any theoretical debate. It was done for Heinz's convenience in editing. And I still suspect it was not the best idea he ever had because it would cause tremendous problems afterwards. Mm -hmm. Can I just add a tiny thing about the, uh, the circular cause and feedback mechanisms title? That appears on uh, several of the proceedings which uh, were invented for Heinz in a sense. There weren't any before he became editor. 